All right, it is my pleasure to introduce our grand round speaker for today. Um, it's Dr. Vinay Prasad. He's a hematologist, oncologist, and professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostats here at UCSF. He runs the VK Prasad Lab at UCSF, which studies cancer drugs, health policy, clinical trials, and better decision making. Uh, he's the author of over 350 academic articles in the books Ending Medical Reversal and Malignant. Uh, he hosts the oncology podcast Plenary Session, the General Medicine Podcast, the VPZD Show, and is active on Substack. He runs a YouTube channel and he tweets at VPrasad MD MPH. He's going to talk to us about how to read and interpret neurosurgery studies. Dr. Thank Prasad. You. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anthony. All right. Well, thank you all. Uh, looking forward to talking to you all about how to read and interpret neurosurgery studies as a non-neurosurgeon. So this is going to be uh, uh, quite a task. And if I say anything wrong, feel free to correct me on the spot. But first, just out of my own curiosity, by show of hands, who here is a medical student thinking, medical student? Okay, who here is uh, uh, in your first three years of neurosurgery residency? Okay, and who's in your last seven years of neurosurgery residency? <laughs> okay, all right, all right, I get a label in. And one attend, and a couple attendees, just one attendee. One attendee. Okay, good. All right, well, you know, what are we gonna talk about? I think we're going to talk a little bit about how to make medical decisions with the landscape of evidence. Um, I'm going to do a few neurosurgery papers that Anthony graciously sent me to look at. Uh, I'm going to talk about CRASH-3, which is TXA. Uh, I'm going to talk more broadly about when you need randomized trials, when you don't need randomized trials. I want to make the point that simply being a randomized study doesn't mean you're a good randomized study. And in fact, you can be a very bad randomized study, as perhaps some of these will be. And if it's a bad randomized study, then in my mind, I don't know if that changes. Oh, sorry, you want me to? So the people at home? Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, you know, if it's a bad randomized study, I don't know if that should affect your practice as much as even observational data. We'll talk about Aruba. And then we'll, I, I was supposed to talk about sport, but after I read it, I said, you know what? I can't, I can't even do it. The amount of crossover was just so much that I don't know what to take away. Um, and uh, we could talk a little about per protocol analysis. So instead I'll talk about the new paper that's out in JAMA about spinal cord stimulation, placebo spinal cord stimulation versus actual stimulation. And then we'll talk a little bit about parachutes because that's, that's supposedly the business we're in in surgery. Let me start with CRASH-3. So what was CRASH-2? CRASH-2 was a randomized control trial of trauma patients, whatever the reason, who are bleeding out randomized to TXA, transaxamic acid, which is a fibrinolytic drug or placebo. And its primary endpoint was all-cause mortality. And CRASH-2 with 10,000 people in each arm shows a reduction in all-cause mortality. It looks like a really good result. So naturally there would be interest in whether or not this drug, TXA, would be useful for acute traumatic brain injury um, and uh, its effect on death, disability, and, and vascular occlusive events. And that's this randomized control trial. It's an interesting randomized trial. They randomized about 13,000 people, which as you'll see soon is very close to what they wanted to randomize their power calculation. About 6,000 got TXA, 6,000 got placebo. Initially, you could enroll in this study if you were randomized within eight hours of, of the injury, but they had a protocol amendment in the middle of this saying, we're gonna really restrict it to people who are randomized within three hours. And a lot of the analyses will use time as an important variable because one hypothesis is this drug, if given too late, may not do anything, but if given early in the right window in the right sweet spot, it might be life-saving. So that's the general thing. And you know, I think so far, I see nothing that's caught my eye. Here was the primary result of the study. The primary result of the study was a unique endpoint called head injury related death. There's death and then there's head injury related death, which requires some adjudication. The doctor has to make a call, is this head injury related death or not? In this study, I think the vast majority of deaths were head injury related deaths, like over 90% of deaths. But put, a, put an asterisk next to it. The original primary endpoint of the study was all cause mortality. They switched to head injury related death because they thought they'd have a little bit more power. But as you can see here, for all head injury related death, this is a total wash, risk ratio 0.94, confidence interval that crosses one. And then if you look in this subgroup that they call pre specified, but it is still a subgroup, you find with even with low Glasgow coma scores, you know, you find that this is null. I mean, I think it touches the it touches one, um, and uh, I would want to see something a little bit more persuasive. Uh, and I'll tell you one more thing in a second here. So they've broken out the results. So we often see this in randomized studies. This is a 
basically a subgroup analysis showing the point estimate in different categories. And as you see here in mild to moderate Glasgow Coma score, it appears to be more favorable than it does in severe GCS. Now, one of the things that they're not reporting that I like to see in a study like this is this is simply the relative risk in these two categories, but you can do a statistical test for interaction and that has its own p-value. And that's literally testing, is this an effect modifier? Is this effect statistically different than this effect? And they haven't reported interaction coefficients throughout the paper, so I don't know what to make of it. I suspect they would be not significant. You really need a lot of power. Now, what's an example where we had an interaction coefficient that was really useful? I would say recovery. Recovery was that UK study for COVID. And back in 2020, when there was no one knew any drug that worked, they found that dexamethasone was life-saving. They randomized about a similar sample size, I think 6,000 and 11,000. But they had enough power to look for interaction by oxygen status. So if you're in the hospital on the floor, not on oxygen, might even look like it was trending towards killing you. If you were on the floor requiring O2, looked a little beneficial, but if you were mechanically ventilated on O2, it looked really beneficial. And that statistical test of interaction is like P.01, so highly significant, but it varies by severity of illness. Here, they don't, you know, they don't report that, and I would like to see that. Obviously, they're showing you pupil reactivity, and it looks like people who are, pupils are reacting, and they're not you know, profoundly injured. They're the ones who look like they're benefiting here. Okay, so now they're getting into the model building in this paper. I found this to be quite interesting. They're showing you that for severe GCS, there is absolutely no relationship between the time you got the infusion and your outcomes. There's the hazard ratio is one, it's the same outcome. So here I think they take advantage of one, one thing good about this study is that it's placebo controlled. So people on the control arm are getting a placebo bag. So then you can match people, even in a model, who got it 45 minutes later, 50 minutes later, 60 minutes later. And they're saying that if you come in with severe GCS, there's just, it looks like there's no signal at all. But for mild and moderate GCS, they're making the argument that there is a benefit, but only if you get it early. Okay, what caught my eye here is a couple of things. One, the models were adjusted for GCS age and systolic blood pressure. In the course of this talk, I'm going to raise the question that the more flexibility you have in your analytic plan, the less I trust a result. Who decided that we're going to adjust for age and systolic blood pressure? Did you decide that before you ran the study? Or did you decide that after somebody comes to me with the preliminary result and they say, hey, it doesn't look so good, just for age and systolic blood pressure and show me the new results, you know? And so you wonder about p-hacking, salami slicing of data when you see things like this. Um, and then the other thing that caught my eye is this, risk ratio 0.58. Well, that's a miracle. I mean, this is huge. This is, this is head injury related death. That's 90% of the deaths. This is one of the this is a, one of the best medical interventions that ever been invented, and to me, what I'm trying to say is it seems too good to be true, and so we all know that being injured in a car accident or being injured in any accident is very heterogeneous, and some people are more profoundly injured than other people. Some people are bleeding more than other people, and it's very possible that there is some imbalance in the injuries in low in in, in high GCS early that is accounting for this difference. So to me, when I look at this, my credibility calculator is I'm pretty low. I'm not sure I believe this. Primary endpoint is negative, and now we're slicing the data in many different ways and finding relationships that appear plausible to us, but who knows how many ways we've looked at the data before we get this signal. And I'm always caught by effect sizes that seem too good to be true. If this was something the surgeons were doing, I would be more likely to believe it than a medication administrator. So the original sample size, we originally estimated a trial with 10,000 people would have 90% power to detect a 15% relative reduction in mortality. However, we changed the primary endpoint to head injury-related death in the hospital within 28 days of injury, inpatients randomly assigned within three hours of injury, and limited recruitment to three hours of injury. We then increased the sample size to 1,300 and have approximately 10,000 people treated within three hours of injury. So what, do I, what does this mean to me? Uh, the more I see endpoint switching, uh, credibility starts to go down uh, in a study. Uh, the more you get to potentially look at your data before you change your statistical plan, credibility goes down in my, in my opinion. Uh, I will save my other examples. So my take, my overall take on this is, you know, frankly, and I, and this, and I say this as somebody who likes to pass out TXA like Skittles. I mean, it's, an, it's a hematologist's best friend because people want something and it's something you can give them. So I have it. So I give a lot of TXA, but that said, I'm not too excited about this study. Um, I would give it to somebody who comes in with high GCS, 
intraparenchymal bleed, but only if I could get it to them maybe the first two hours. And if the two hours were passed or I had other things on my mind or I forgot about it, I wouldn't feel too bad about it because I think the likelihood it's actually benefiting people is small. Uh, I talked to one of my friends in neurosurgery and he said that, you know, he likes to give it just because it's something to give and, you know, you don't have a lot of tools in the toolbox. And I think that's not unreasonable, uh, but I personally wouldn't prioritize it and I wouldn't beat myself up if I forgot about it. And if there is a new study that comes out in the next decade, I would, I would actually bet money that it will, it will fail to replicate in another large randomized study if I had to bet my own money. So when do we need randomized control trials? I think this is, this is a perpetual question that, that, that we all deal with in biomedicine, particularly in this modern age, particularly in your field, where so much of what you do, I think, is not readily amenable to randomization. It's very difficult to randomize. And the examples I always hear are smoking and parachutes. You know, we, are, we know not to smoke, but there are no randomized trials that made you puff, puff away for 40 years to prove it was harmful. We know that when you get thrown out of an airplane, you'd rather be thrown out with a parachute on your back than without one. So are these good examples that say that means randomization, you know, it has a small role, you know, we don't know when to use it. Uh, in this paper, we try to put it, put it in perspective. And this is by Logan Powell. He's an aspiring neurosurgeon. He's a second year student, but he wants to do what you all do. All right, so here's how I'll conceptualize it for you. Imagine this axis. This is the axis of everything you can do to somebody with an impact on their health. Okay, on one end of the axis is the worst thing you can do somebody to hurt them. On the other end of the axis is the best thing you can do to somebody to help them or save their life. And in the middle is all the things you can do that have no net effect. Okay, so what's the worst thing you can do to somebody for their health? Any guesses? What'd you say? Yeah, okay, I like it. But how are you going to do it? Come on, we need a plan. I like it. Shoot a person in a vital body part like the head. That's a, that, that'll get the job done. Or hit a person in a car at high velocity. Not that I've been thinking about it, but you know, you could, you could do something like that. Now, did you know there has never been a randomized controlled trial of being shot in the head to know it's harmful? But we all agree it's pretty harmful. Probably has a fatality rate depending on you know, where you shoot. I see this Phineas Gage skull at the Harvard Library. But depending on where you shoot, it's really, it's not gonna be pretty. Um, so I think with a huge effect that's harmful, what do you need to persuade yourself that it's harmful? And I think the answer is two or three anecdotes. And that's how human beings learned it was harmful to build that causal model. The effect size is so large, so detrimental, evolution would have a huge selection advantage for thinking that it's harmful and making some causal links. That's what we need, we're persuaded. Now, what's the best thing you can do to somebody for their health? <laughs> we, say, we say murder too. <laughs> Yeah. Money. Oh, better than money. Better than that. Imagine, imagine later today. <laughs> imagine later today, you see me out there on, on the sidewalk and I'm looking at my phone as, as I'm likely to do. And the bus is about to get me and you pull me back and the bus whizzes by. Then I'm going to say, hey, you saved my life. Thank you. Pushing some of the way at a speeding car, throwing me out of an airplane, but giving me a parachute. I think I'll concede to you that you saved my life. If I fell out of that airplane without a parachute, my risk of death is 99.9999999. It's not 100% though, actually. There are a few case reports of people surviving freefall from tremendous heights. I think they flatten their body or something. I don't know, I haven't, I haven't strategized about that. And if you jump out of an airplane with the parachute, you know what the death rate is? It's, it, it's three per 10 million jumps. U.S. National Parachuting Association. Who's a member? Any members of the parachuting? I think you got to get a thousand jumps under your belt before you can be one. But it's not zero, actually. I mean, it occasionally doesn't open. Uh, and so my point is that a parachute when you fall out of an airplane has an absolute risk reduction on mortality of 99.9999997% over 15-minute time horizon. It's possibly one of the most impressive interventions ever invented and actually has very little analogy to biomedicine because even the best of what we do doesn't typically work like that kind of a light switch. We may have good things, I'll show you some data later, the best things we have, but 99.9% .9 outcomes is very difficult to achieve. In the middle, we have a whole bunch of other things. We have smoking. Odds ratio for smoking and lung cancer is 20. 
eating bacon. Meta-analytic estimates say that if you eat bacon once a week, your increased risk of CV disease is maybe 1.75 odds ratio. Um, if you eat a blueberry once a week, your risk benefit is 0.997 in meta-analysis. So there's a whole bunch of nutritional stuff that's just hugging that no effect center line. And then there's things that stand out here. How do we assess interventions on this side of the scale, things that are putatively harmful? We don't do randomized control trials to assess putative harms. Next to smoking, you could put drinking a cup of benzene or putting pesticides in your food. Okay, we don't do, we don't do randomized trials on this end. We do risk factor epidemiology. And we typically, we abate them if we think that there's a suggestion of harm. For things in the dead center, it's very difficult as I'll show you. But let's talk about what's over here. Over here is most of what we do in medicine. We're not in the make people worse business. Well, not typically. We're in the try to make people better off business. We do things that are a putative efficacy, but we're also not in the 99.9% .9 business. We're in the 5% business, 10% business, 2% business. In oncology, maybe the 0.1% business, sadly. We're doing things that might benefit somebody, but at best have a very small effect size. And that ironically is where randomization works very, very nicely. Randomization works to separate your bias, your optimism and, and profiteering from the correct effect of the effect. And TXA is clearly in that category. If TXA was gonna work, it was gonna work modestly. And the nice way to test TXA would be a randomized control trial. If you showed me an observational study of TXA, I'll tell you what the problems would be. Hospitals that administer TXA very rapidly are probably very different than hospitals that don't. A good hospital that has its act together is probably much more likely to give that quickly than a hospital that doesn't have its act together. And it might not be the TXA, but all the other things that go into hospital having its act together, like better trainees, better faculty, uh, you know, better health systems, better nursing support, all those things, and even maybe a richer clientele. And so an observational study of the TXA question would be, I think, quite limited. So what about why simply being randomized does not make you useful? And I think this is the other part of it, which is that even though I think randomized trials are very, very good, at separating modest and marginal effect sizes from no effect size at all, simply being randomized doesn't mean you're gospel. And I think there can be randomized studies that are worse than non-randomized studies. Take Aruba. Aruba, of course, is medical management with or without interventional therapy for unruptured brain AV malformations. Now, I imagine that you all do a lot of this. Back in the day, they did it a lot open. Now they do a lot endovascularly. And I imagine that there's a whole new, every year there's new coils and devices that they're developing for this. So the intervention itself is almost always in flux. It's never the same intervention year to year. This is a randomized control trial. And to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the only one to date ever done on AV malformation randomized. Yeah. So this is a randomized study that sought to ask, which is preferable, medical management, which I imagine is good blood pressure control and you know, all those sorts of things the internist does uh, versus medical management, plus you guys coiling, you all coiling something or, or clipping something. Statistical plan. The design for Aruba approved by the NINDS section was for 800 patients to be randomized in equal allocation, interventional therapy versus medical therapy. This design, and this is the part I found really interesting. This design assumed a five-year event rate of 12% for patients treated with medical therapy alone and a 22% rate of events for interventional therapy. Here events I think are bad. That's a brain bleed, that's a stroke. 22% with interventional therapy. It had statistical power of 87.5% to detect a 40% reduction in the hazard ratio for death or symptomatic strokes over five years. Because of the lower than expected accrual rates after 18 months of randomization, the Data Safety Monitoring Board accepted a revised design from the investigators. The sample size was 400. It reduces the trial power to 80%. And now they're looking for a 46% reduction in death or symptomatic stroke for medical management. So one point here is that, um, that with a certain sample size, you have a certain power. So this has an 80% power to detect a 46% reduction, but it has a 90% power potentially to detect an 80% reduction. In other words, as you postulate a smaller and smaller uh, delta, you usually need a huge sample size to have adequate power to exclude that delta because the sample size of a study changes to the square of the delta that you've postulated. But the one thing that caught my eye here is, which one do they think is gonna be better? How, does, how do you read this? Who's gonna be better according to their, their power calc? Huh? Medical management, that makes no sense to me. 
I thought the purpose of the study is to show that the addition of intervention has a benefit over just medical management alone. Both arms are getting medical management. Why should medical management prove superiority to doing medical management in a surgery? So to me, it was fundamentally backwards. And I think they're doing this to, I actually don't know why they're doing this. Maybe somebody will tell me the answer by the end of this. So they took 1700 people. And now this is where we really get into the problem of the study, because this is really, this is gonna be painful what happens here. 1740 people are assessed for eligibility. 1500 are not enrolled. And why aren't they enrolled? We don't know but we're just losing so much of this study population. We're left with 226 are enrolled, the randomized interventional therapy or medical management. Now, as you all know, AV malformations, as far as I can tell, they're not in the same spot in the brain. Now, I understand the brain has several spots. It has the, the front spot and the back spot and, uh, and the deep spot and then the, the easy to get spot. And that's about the extent of my anatomic knowledge that I remember. Um, but I would imagine that if you're a surgeon and you see somebody and they have an aneurysm in the easy to get spot, you might just go ahead and get it because it's in the easy to get spot. And then I would imagine if you had a patient that you saw who had an aneurysm in the, oh, I don't know if I really want to do this by myself spot, then maybe you'd enroll that person in the study because that person, if they get randomized to not doing it, you can say, hey, look, I'm contributing to knowledge. And you know, I, you didn't want to do it anyway, right? Because you want to go all the way down in there and get it. And that to me is a big problem with this study, because if you're losing such a high percentage of the eligible population, that's not going to be lost at random. It's going to be lost contingent on your desire to randomize, which I think is probably deeply tied to where the heck this thing is. So by the time we randomize, and remember the revised power calc, they want 400 people, but they didn't get 400 people. They only got 226 people, and then they halted the study. And they randomized 116 to interventional therapy plus medical management or 100 to medical management alone. And then they ran their trial. And here's what they found. They found that indeed the study was halted because it looked so bad for the intervention. Intervention is the blue, the red is the medical management, higher is worse, that means they're having events. And it looks pretty clearly that hazard ratio 0.19. I don't know what a hazard ratio is, but I know that's that's not a good number. No, that's not a good number if that's harm. Uh, hazard ratio, of course, is the is the ratio of the instantaneous rate of event across all points in time, but actually is technically not a relative risk and to use them interchangeably is wrong. They're often slightly divergent uh, and actually is actually pretty much meaningless. It has no plain English way of putting a hazard ratio. You can't tell the patient, for instance, you have an 81% chance of stroke if you did surgery versus not. That would actually be, I think, technically inaccurate. Uh, yet I think it's misused a lot. But anyway, here it's clear, it's bad. It didn't look so good. But what are we to conclude? You know, what am I to conclude of this? One point I want to make is that whenever you stop a randomized trial early for benefit or for harm, I mean, randomized trials are stopped because the outcome ratio is extremely skewed. One arm has way more events than the other arm. And whenever you stop something early for harm, you are not stopping at random. You are stopping because it looks really, really bad. And if you were to run that trial a thousand times over again, you have likely exaggerated how bad it looks. So this is by Montori and colleagues from Mayo Clinic, they look at clinical studies that were truncated or not truncated, meaning stopped early. And what they find is that truncated RCTs were associated with greater effect sizes than RCTs not stopped early. This difference was independent of the presence of statistical stopping rules and greatest in small studies. So to me, Aruba stinks in many ways. One, patient selection on the way in. And two, whatever that harm signal is in real life, if you ran it a thousand times, I think it would be much smaller. I mean, the curves would be much closer together than what they have caught. They have caught the moment of exaggerated effect size, in my opinion. So what's my takeaway of Aruba? Not so useful, not so useful. In fact, I don't know what I would, I don't know how I would interpret it if I was, if I were doing your job, I don't know what it would mean other than if you have a person who you are reluctant to go and clip the aneurysm, then you should be reluctant to go and clip the aneurysm. You know, I think that, I think that's what, I mean, that might be the take home message, which is something quite obvious. Um, and also I'm struggled to understand why they powered it backwards in my opinion, because I think in general, when we do things in biomedicine, we should prove that doing more is better rather than prove that doing less is better. I think that that's how I view the purpose of medicine. Okay, any questions? Okay, now let's get into some of the, the fun stuff. One more RCT. This just came out while we were, just while we were chatting, it just came out last week or the week before. The effect of spinal cord burst stimulation versus placebo stimulation. 
I don't know much about this, but my understanding is that some people after lumbar spinal surgery, they don't feel all the way better. Is that fair to say? Not all of them feel all the way better. I think that's accurate. Some have chronic radicular pain after lumbar spinal surgery because they don't feel all the way better. And one of the things you all do is you implant a spinal stimulator. And I imagine that this has, dwells inside the body and has little wires that go to the spine and delivers bursts of electrical current that, that cool, what is it? It, 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 it potentiates the neurons. So the neurons relax later or something like that, but uh, uh, more or less, okay, okay. Maybe it's entirely inaccurate, but okay. This is what people have been doing. This is a very nice study. It comes from the Nordic group and they love to do sham controls in, in the Scandinavian countries. They love to do a lot of good studies, um, but I think they particularly like targeting very expensive interventional studies uh, for sham control because you know they are, they're a single payer system. And so it will save them all the public purse a lot of money. But this is actually, I actually think this is a spectacular study. I mean, I can't find any fault in it. So they took people 18 years or older, they'd undergone at least one decompressive or fusion procedure for degenerative lumbar spine disease. They experienced post-operative chronic radicular pain that was refractory to non-surgical treatment for six months. They reported average pain intensity with a minimum of five on a scale of one to 10 using the numeric rating scale. Higher scores mean more severe pain, zero means no pain, and 10 means the worst pain imaginable. So I never know what to interpret when people say their pain is 12. I don't know what to make of it, you know? Because I thought 10 was the max. It's the worst imaginable. I never know. Um, and no additional spine surgery or pharmacologic treatment was assumed to be beneficial. So this is really the worst of the worst, the people getting this spinal cord stimulator. And then they put them in everybody. Everyone gets the spinal cord stimulator. So we all go through that process. But then they do something very clever, which is they randomize you to turning it on or not turning it on. Okay? It's either turned on or not turned on. You could do this with your air purifier at home. You could turn it on or put the light, or just put a light on it. It's hard to tell the difference. It might be hard to tell the difference. So they randomize it to three months. You know, half of them have it on, half of them have it off. And they switch, then they randomize again and again and again. So now you have both intra-patient comparisons and between group comparisons. Randomized controlled trials are only typically only valid for between arm comparisons. You got to compare one arm to the other. But very rarely you can be you can have intra-individual comparisons for short-term reversible endpoints that the person will be blinded to the intervention. We can do it for SSRIs and depression. We can do it for turning on or off your thing. And here's what they find. The trial was designed to, this, this is actually one of the best power calcs I've ever read in a study. The trial was designed to detect a between group difference of 10 points corresponding to the minimal clinically important difference in change of the mean ODSI score, and I'll show you what those mean, between periods of burst stimulation and periods of placebo stimulation. What's an MCID? You know, all these trials are always powered for some difference between the two arms. In oncology, we like to power our trials for a 15 minute survival benefit. We're looking for a really good, robust primary endpoint, like 15 whole minutes. But you know, the problem with that is 15 minutes might not be meaningful to a patient. You know, you, you think I'm joking, but actually we have trials with, uh, I think the shortest we have is a 10 day survival benefit or a lot in pancreas cancer, but that might not be meaningful to somebody to take a hundred thousand dollar medicine, have toxicity for 10 days might not be meaningful. So to solve that problem, the best way is to survey patients and doctors and ask what the minimally clinically important difference is the MCID. And then you're powering it for something that's real. It's the minimum difference that would matter to somebody. And this trial is doing that. They've actually surveyed people and they find that 10 points is what people think is the minimal difference in pain. Assuming that the population mean was 10, standard deviation was 18, a one sample t-test of the difference at 0.05 significance into 34 patients received 90% power due to expected rates of 10 or 20% attrition, we hypothesized that 50 people in each arm would be good. And I think all their assumptions are very, very fair. And in fact, you'll see they'll have much less attrition than that. So in fact, they're probably overpowered. They probably got pretty good power for something quite small, even a six, per, six point difference. This is really very well done. I mean, I think people may quibble with 50-50, but if you read the calc, and think about it, it's actually pretty pretty rock solid. This is the Oswestry Disability Index. You ever use this? You do? Okay, oh good, yeah. It's, not, it's new to me, new to me. Mm -hmm. my, my neurosurgery knowledge is just one month on your service, many, maybe more than 10 years ago. That's all I know. And I, I was asked to, to put, use the Midas and put a hole in, but I tore, I tore the dura. <laughs> little bit of an angle, a little bit of an angle, faux pas. So that's why, I wasn't allowed to enter surgery. Yeah, that's just, just blacklisted right then and there. Um, 
So, so this questionnaire I think is pretty good. And the MCID, you know, I explained it to you. Okay. These are the results. I, I just, I was just saying, this is a really good figure. Okay. This is a really good figure. This is everybody. If you've done this more than once, if you've been random, if you've been purse, they're, they're averaging your drug, your, your burst stimulation and your placebo, if you've done it more than once. So every line is one person. Okay. And what it's showing you is the, the dot is where you start out on the disability index. A higher number is worse, right? Yeah. And then the line goes to where you end up. A lower number is better. Okay. So what they show you is, look at this. At, when they start, they range in disability from like 30 to what, 65 points. This person's in a lot of, this person's suffering and this person's, you know, okay. And they're dropping. And on the left, they're showing you everyone when they got the machine on. And on the right, they're showing you everyone when they got the machine off. And what it shows me really clearly is that there are dramatic individual accounts in both. Like if you were doing this as a doctor and this person was like, doc, you know, I feel so bad. I'm not doing good. And then they put it in like, oh my God, it's amazing. I feel so great. There's somebody who had the same response on placebo. This person is practically sprinting out your door. Look at that person. And so you have dramatic responses in both directions. You also have a few people who look, you turn it on and they're getting worse, but the same on placebo. They're getting worse on placebo too. And so what you see here clearly is if you didn't know which color was which, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And I think it's really sobering. If you look at all the pre-specified endpoints, it's a total wash. Uh, you know, there's absolutely no difference in the disability index. All the secondary endpoints like leg pain, back pain, quality of life, absolutely no difference. Even how much steps you take a day, we all tracking our steps meticulously, even that's no difference. And so this is just a stone cold negative study that it don't matter if that machine, I mean, you can put it in. Some people are gonna feel better. In fact, most people feel better. Why do they feel better? It's not that the thing is on or off. That has nothing to do with feeling better. It's probably that you care for them. You listen to them and you put the box in them and you said it was gonna make them feel better. And that's why they feel better. But the on or off of the box is irrelevant. And so it's really just, you know, the placebo effect of being a doctor. And I actually bet that if you really sold it to them, like went in there and really told them how much better they feel, it'd probably be better than if you just gave it a half-hearted, like, I don't know, maybe it worked, you know? I think if you really, you know, you have to take, I mean, it's something, we all take advantage of it in the clinic. So what's my takeaway? This is entirely convincing to me. And until something better comes along, I think it's pretty much game over for this technology. But I actually think in the US, practice is probably not gonna change that much because it's gonna be reimbursed for a while. So until a better sham study comes along, I wouldn't do it. But what do I know? As I said, my knowledge of brain anatomy is easy to touch and harder to touch. So I don't know much about this. I'll give you another anal an analogy of when this happened. This is Orbita. These are, these are the heart doctors. We can beat up on them. Many years ago, they were putting in a lot of stents in hearts. So many stents. Some of those stents they put in for people who have an acute ST elevation myocardial infarction. Okay, I give them that. That's a good thing to do. Absolute risk reduction over 30 days? Not 99.999%. It's actually closer to the 15 percentage point ballpark. That's removing the, that's like opening up the artery when you have an MI. You're getting 15%. That's huge. But think about how far apart it is from 99. Okay. They were doing that. That's good. What about non-ST elevation MI? And they opened that up with high TIMI risk score. Very good. Life-saving. No doubt about it. But what about I come in and I have chronic reproducible angina? When I shovel the snow on my driveway like I used to in Chicago, I get a little chest tightness. But when I stop, it goes away. When I walk 10 blocks, I get chest tightness. When I stop, it goes away. They were putting in the lion's share of the stents in those people. And they did so for a couple of reasons. One, they said you're going to live longer. Two, they said you're less likely to have a heart attack. Well, then there was a randomized trial called Courage that came along in 2009 that showed actually, surprise, surprise, you're not going to live any longer. They live the same. And actually, there's no reduction in heart attack. So then they were really hurting because we got about $15 billion in market share that's about to be hit hard. So then they found a new endpoint that they loved. And that endpoint was at least you feel better. Hey, listen, life is about more than how long you live. It's about how you feel. And you feel better if I put that stent in. And in fact, on every quality of life survey, stent versus no stent, you definitely feel better. And they had another more objective endpoint, which is the modified Bruce protocol treadmill. It's where you get on this treadmill and they make you run and it goes faster and faster, and faster until you die. And uh, not until you, until you complain of your chest pain. And it turns out a healthy person, you know, maybe, maybe you all, well, before you went to residency, you could probably do 10 or 12 minutes. Maybe you drop, you lose a couple of minutes in neurosurgery residency. Um, but in this study, they could do maybe about, I don't know, six, seven minutes. And if you stented them open and made them do it again, they gain 90 seconds. 
And then we ask cardiologists, what's the MCID, the minimally clinically important difference? It's 30 seconds. So say we take 30 seconds and they approve these drugs like renolazine and these other drugs that you know, they, they don't work so well, but they're like 40 seconds. Okay. So 90 seconds, if you do it, 45 is minimally clinically important difference. And we approve some drugs in that ballpark for how you feel. But the control arm of all these studies was stenting versus not doing it. And so all that placebo effect comes with the stenting, but not with the not doing it. So Daryl Francis and colleagues at Imperial College London, they had a great idea. We're going to either stent them or we're going to tell them we stented them, but we're not going to do it. So they got 200 people. They powered their study for 30 seconds. Okay, the MCID is, four, is, 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 is 30. They powered for 30. And people say they're, they're going to say in retrospect, you're underpowered. But they say, Daryl Francis famously said, that if you don't understand why 30 seconds is an adequate power, the only thing underpowered is your brain. And uh, I think that was when he got in a little bit of trouble for saying that, but he did say that. Um, so they powered for 30 seconds, MCID, 100 and, uh, 104 and 90 people. And they only pick people with one vessel disease and angina. This is also very clever because if I have two blockages in my heart and chest tightness, then which one is causing the chest tightness? But if I only have one blockage in my heart and chest tightness, then it has to be, if it's gonna be something, it's got to be that. Those are all labels with the asterisk, and they're actually very tight. I don't look at these for a living, but people tell me that these don't look good. And they either randomize you to, they put headphones on you, and they poke you in the groin when they, as they do. And in one arm, they go and do a diagnostic cath, and the other arm, they don't do the diagnostic. Yeah, they don't put the stent in. And you listen to music, and then they tell you in both arms that you had it done. So it's a beautiful trial, sham control. And guess what? That 90 seconds before and after that we saw with ACME many years ago, it's evaporated. The absolute difference observed is 16 seconds, but the p-value is like extremely non-significant. It's a totally negative study. That stenting chronic stable angina, you don't even feel better. And people said that like, oh, hey, 16 seconds would have been positive if this was 1,000 people. And he said, who cares? We already said the MCID was 30. So why would we do something like this, costly invasive? Why would we spend $15 billion a year for something beneath the minimally clinically important difference? So this is a really good study. We wrote some papers on this. We say, we have this whole theory that we've been trying to develop on you know, if you have a, me a, a procedural intervention for pain, how would you sham it? It's actually not so clear because in the course of your sham process, you may inadvertently betray to the person that you are actually doing something. For instance, even though they put the headphones on and then they poked them and they were doing the procedure, I bet the people who had the stent put in had a different experience than the people who did it. They probably were on the table longer. And maybe they could feel when they were blowing up that balloon or whatever and, you know, opening their stent up. And so what we have hypothesized it, I'll skip it. We hypothesize, we've written some papers on how you can tell the difference, whether or not it really works. All right. So what do we call this? A phenomenon where a costly widespread medical intervention gains a lot of popularity, but later is found not to work. We call that medical reversal. We've been working on that for a long time now, wrote a book about it maybe seven years ago. Um, and we did one analysis that you'll like. How often does it happen? How often do all these things we do in biomedicine? I guess one question is, you may wonder, how many things do we do in biomedicine? I estimate we probably do something in the order of magnitude of 10 to the power of seven or 10 to the power of eight different things from surgery, clipping AV aneurysms to everything you do every morning. You walk in, you replete electrolytes. You know, We do millions and millions of things. But the subset of things that we have a randomized controlled trial evidence on is probably in the ballpark of 10 to the power of six. So, you know, maybe one in 10 things we have randomized trials, but there's so much of medicine that's passed on as tradition, as, as practice, as art uh, that we don't study. Eventually, however, some tiny fraction of that does come under study. We took something we've been doing for 10 years and we finally subjected to rigorous appraisal. And we were curious when that happens, how often is it contradicted? How often is it validated? So here's how we studied it. We took every original article that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine in a decade. We've now extended this to like 25 years. That was 2,000 original articles. And these were all read in duplicate by two reviewers. And that's why God invented medical students to do this kind of hard-hitting work. Actually, though, I say that, but it's actually the best research project because if you are a student and you read these papers, you're going to be like the smartest student on earth because you're coding like pretty much the premier medical literature, you know, kind of. I actually had to read all the papers, sadly, to be the triple code. Uh, I learned a lot. So 65% concern in medical practice. One third don't. 
And basically this means that one third is like new molecular target, but two thirds are like, I don't know, should you put that stent in? Should I wear the gown and gloves if the patient's swab is MRSA positive? Should I give crystalloid or colloid? Two thirds are that. And if you're that, 73% is something new. Is rivaroxaban better than Coumadin? Is uh, Prasagrel better than Plavix? Something like that. And if you test something new, and if you're in the New England Journal of Medicine, who wants to tell me what the result of that study is? Novel drug, novel device, New England Journal. What's the answer? Positive. 77% find the practice beneficial. 17% find the practice no better or worse. Only 17% say it doesn't work. Back to the drawing board. This is called publication bias. This is publication bias. New England Journal of Medicine, they don't want to publish your failed drug. They want to publish a winner. Why? Because they care about one thing the reprint sales. I mean, the impact factor of the journal. They care about the impact factor of the journal. And the impact factor of the journal is not going to go up. No one is going to cite some failed anticoagulant five years later. They're going to cite the practice-changing trial. And so they want practice-changing studies, and that's their, that's their bias. But these are practices that test something novel. What about things like Aruba that test some, or things like the spinal cord stimulator? Test something established. We're already doing. Now here, the Incentive for impact factor is not so clear because we're going to talk about it, whether it's positive or negative. If whatever the result of courage is, we're going to talk about it. We're going to cite it. Some of us may cite it just to dunk on it, but some of us may cite it to praise it. We're going to be arguing about it forever. So now you may concede that they're very interested because that's going to be cites and cites what's put food on the table at that journal. So what do you think the breakdown is here? If you test something established. Now the incentive is taken away. The mere publication, uh, the mere testing of established practice, I think is provocative. And the answer is it's, it's, it's pretty much 50-50. 48% of the time you validate the practice, 40% of the time you find it's no better or worse. So what does that lead me to believe? I do believe that for many medical practices, if we subjected them to rigorous appraisal, many, many would be like spinal cord stimulator or stenting stable angina. I think perhaps even 100 to 200, $300 billion of US federal healthcare spending could easily be curtailed. Everything is in this list, medications, procedures, devices, surgeries, screening tests, like the PSA, over-the-counter medications, vitamins, supplements, treatment algorithms. You may remember, you all do a little bit of it. We used to like people on Plavix, you'd send like a platelet reactivity assay. If the platelets were still reacting too much, you'd crank it up to Ticagrelor or Prasagrel. Well, somebody actually did a randomized trial of like 4,000 people called Arctic, where they randomize you to test the platelet reactivity or not and they changed the drugs if it was reactive versus not, and there was no difference in any cardiovascular outcome, so that Arctic was in the heart. Um, diagnostic instruments like that swan Gans catheter, systems interventions like gown and glove precautions, uh, you know, many of these things have fallen by the wayside, like gown and gloves for people who are MRSA positive sounds really great. You have two cluster randomized trials that are negative, bug and uh, star ICU. Why does reversal happen? Why do we have medical practices that end up like this? And the bottom line is that always we adopted something based on inadequate and biased studies without definitive trials ongoing and forthcoming. And actually, this is one of my biggest problems with a lot of pandemic policy is that you adopt something without ongoing efforts to reduce uncertainty. And why do you adopt things? You adopt things based on pathophysiology alone, like it, it's plausible that it would work. Pathophysiology plus anecdotal evidence, or what we call medical oncology. No, I mean, there's a lot of that in medical oncology. There's a lot of that in medical oncology. Epidemiologic evidence, which is just plagued with residual confounding. The moment you look at epidemiologic evidence like nutrition, diet, and exercise, I once read a study that said people who have colon cancer get it cut out, their odds of recurrence are related to how many tree nuts they eat. First thing I had to think about, what the hell, what's a tree nut? How's it different than a nut? Apparently a peanut is not a tree nut, it's a legume. So that's number one. So peanuts don't count. And you have to eat tree nuts. And here's the thing, you have to eat two ounces of tree nuts three times a week. So, so first of all, there's a Brazil nut, a hazelnut, a walnut, a cashew. But you can't just eat it all at once. You gotta eat two ounces three times a week. So first of all, you have to be able to afford that kind of tree nut habit. I'm sorry, residents, you may not be able to do it. As an attending, I can, thank you very much. I can afford the tree nut habit, but I don't have the wherewithal to space out my tree nuts <laughs> like that, you know? I'll bolus my tree nuts and then I'll forget about it. So what kind of a person is spacing out their tree nuts? You think that's an average person? That's a very health conscious, obsessed person. It's a very socioeconomically well-off person. That person may not even have to work for money to be able to have so much time to apportion tree nuts. And so 
The study shows a reduction in colon cancer death. It shows a bigger reduction in all-cause death. They gloss over that. But I was like, look at this. The tree nuts, they're saving you from colon cancer, but they're also saving you even more like from car accidents and smoking. I mean, they're just saving you. And it has so many problems. And then the other thing is like, there's no drug. There's no drug that has ever prevented cancer recurrence that doesn't shrink that cancer you know, tumor in the body. And you can take some of colon cancer and you can IV bolus tree nuts and there's nothing gonna shrink. And so to me, it's so implausible. And this is like covered in the New York Times. It's a GM oncology paper. And, you know, then I pointed out all these shortcomings and, you know, the authors weren't happy about it, but they didn't like it. Randomized trials. I always say up here, randomized trials are also prone to reversal. Why? Here are the classic problems. One, inappropriate patients. They were too young or not representative. This is Aruba. I don't think, who are these people that survive this gauntlet? Inappropriate dosing, comparators, concomitant medications. I've read asthma trials where you're not allowed to take all of the mainstays of asthma treatments and you're randomized to the new drug or placebo. Whose, trial, whose practice does that help? I don't purposely deprive my patients of life-saving medicines so I can run your, so I can consider your drug. Single center studies, whenever you read, probably neurosurgery, if it's only done in one center, it's much more likely to be biased because it could be heavily influenced by unique charismatic people at that institution. And I know some of your people who are incredibly charismatic surgeons, and maybe in their hands it looks good, but is it really extrapolatable? Um, I'll skip some of these. Early termination and meta-analysis. Everyone says, oh, it's a meta-analysis. It's better. It's a meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is like a juicer. It only tastes as good as what you put in that juicer. They're putting a lot of rotten fruit in that juicer. You know, they put a lot of rotten stuff in there. Okay, let's talk about, well, we are down to nine minutes. And I believe that the best, no matter how good the talk is, if it goes one minute over, it's misery. So we're not going to stop exactly at 59 after. So you have a choice. In the next nine minutes, you can choose to hear about parachutes, which means you'll hear about some oncology drug that you may not be interested in, but it is quite parachute looking. Or you can hear about observational data and why, you know, it is really, really problematic. Why the news always flip-flops about um, nutrition stuff, for instance. So which is the choice? Who votes? I want to hear about oncology drug that might be a parachute. And who votes? I want to hear about nutritional epidemiology. Oh, wow. This is like, yeah, okay, easy. Look at you. I thought you were in the parachute business. I see. I see you're not. Okay. Observational studies. This big center part, you know, I showed you the zone of randomization. You have to have a putative benefit to randomize somebody. You don't, I've never seen a randomized trial of drinking pesticides. Okay, that doesn't exist. We use risk factor epidemiology on the harmful side. We use randomization on the, on the beneficial side. But observational studies, actually, you can do both. You can do risk factor epidemiology and the harm, and you can do observational studies to try to clarify efficacy. And we have so many of them. When you get really close to the line, when you get to common exposures like that, you know, like nuts, you're going to get a big problem. So for the sake of time, I'll just explain one of the classic problems. I won't do time zero, but it's a big problem. Well, maybe I will. Are observational studies reliable? One, people always say like, why is the observational study not reliable? They always say confounding, confounding, confounding. There's some other variable that is influencing the outcome that's associated with the exposure that's not the exposure. For instance, go back in the day, do people who carry matchbooks in their pockets are more likely to die of lung cancer? Answer, yes, but it isn't because they're holding the matchbook in their pocket because they smoke more. So it's a classic sort of confounding problem. But we have ways to try to minimize confounding. It's almost impossible to eliminate. Technically, randomization doesn't always eliminate it. It just equilibrates outcome distributions and minimizes most confounders, minimizes known and unknown confounders in order to equilibrate the outcome distribution in the absence of a treatment effect. But we have another problem, time zero and multiplicity. And those, I think, are much bigger problems with observational literature, much more damning problems that we don't talk enough about. Let's talk about time zero. In a randomized study, for all the faults of it, we anchor that time zero. That's the time you open that envelope and get your answer, A or B. You are all start, start the clock at the same point. But we don't start the clock at the same point for a retrospective chart review. For instance, if you took the UCSF hospital right now and you took everyone who's hospitalized with a heart attack or a stroke and you asked, do people who get a bag of Cheetos while they're in the hospital or Doritos if they eat a bag of Cheetos or Doritos, do they have a survival advantage after a stroke or heart attack than if they don't eat a bag of Cheetos or Doritos? And the answer will be, yes, they do. They have a huge survival advantage if they eat Cheetos. And you would think to yourself, Cheetos do not help stroke. So how? And then the answer is, of course, that if you were hospitalized with a stroke and you're dead in the first four hours, you're not going to be able to eat your bag of Cheetos. <laughs> 
you're not going to be able to eat a meal. In order to eat a meal before you're discharged, you have to already be so much better, right? And that's guarantee time. People don't always see it, but lots of drugs are that way. People hospitalize who end up taking metformin. Do they do better than people who don't take metformin? Well, if you died in the first four hours, you're not going to get your home metformin administered by the intern. You know, you have to live enough days that somebody will add it back to your MAR. So, so many things in medicine have guarantee time or immortal time built in, which is time that the group that didn't get it, they alone could have bad outcomes. You were guaranteed not to have a bad outcome in that time because that's what it means to be in that group. So anything that separates groups by something that occurs after time zero will create immortal time or guarantee time. And it's a huge problem in observational research and probably a problem in a lot of neurosurgery research. The other challenge is multiple hypothesis testing or multiplicity. And this is such a grave challenge that I think it can never be overcome. It will never be overcome. And, it, and, and, it, and it, it's, just gonna, it's just gonna lead to false inference. Let me give you one example. This is a really nice paper done by Brian Nozick from the University of Virginia. And here's what he does. He takes an Excel spreadsheet. In the Excel spreadsheet are all the variables of the project. They're already coded. They're all in the spreadsheet. And he gives it to 22 research teams and he asks them a question. Here's what he does. He takes the Premier League soccer records for like 20 years in Europe, the soccer records. And apparently in soccer, if you do something wrong, you can get a penalty card, a red card. And he's, he's curious about who is getting the red cards. And every player in the soccer league, he gets their photo. And then he has a group of researchers look at that photo and on a scale of one to five, assign the skin color a number. I don't agree with that part. I think that's, that's wrong, but that's what they do. Okay, they do this in study. So a darker skin player is five and lighter skin player is one and they have like five different numbers. Okay, so this means the researchers don't get to assign the skin tone because you can imagine there's a little debate about skin tone, but it's already given to them in the spreadsheet. And they ask a simple question, do darker skin players, are they more likely to get the penalty card? In other words, are the referees potentially racist? And that's the question. He gives it to 22 research teams. This is the exact same Excel spreadsheet, exact same spreadsheet. And he asks them, and these aren't just like, you know, amateur teams. These are 22 seasoned statistical teams. Here's what they find. A bunch of them, the ones that are uh, black, they're like, no, no difference. There's no difference in outcome. This person, may, even the point estimate actually says that actually, if anything, the white players are getting more, the lighter skin players are getting more. Then a whole bunch of people say, you know, it's 1.2 times harmful. And then like three teams say like, it's three times more likely. They're like extremely biased, the, the referees. And the point here is that same data set, different investigators, somebody has done this with a different data set. You get a huge range of possible outcomes. And this is a question where, in my opinion, there is a quote unquote right answer, which is either they're going to be racist or they're not going to be racist, but it would be implausible for us to believe they actually have reverse discrimination. But if you took a question where we have no intuition about it, I think you'll get as big a range as you want. If you took a question like, you know, blueberries or saccharin or milk, and I'll show you an example. And that's why the medical news feels like this. This was a cartoon a few years ago from the New England Journal of Panic Inducing Gobbledygook. You spin the wheel. Coffee can cause depression in twins, according to a new study report today. This is New York Times Welcome. Coffee can cause depression in twins. And it feels that way. Now, a few years ago, I was reading these papers. You know me. If I want health advice, I turn to Medscape. It's the best health advice. And one day I was reading it and I saw this damning headline. Vitamin E increases all cause mortality. I thought to myself, oh no. I went to my medicine cabinet. I opened it up. I took those three bottles of gel caps and I threw them in the trash. Never again, vitamin E, will you kill me? But I acted hastily. A week later, the vitamin E mortality study was challenged. New research showed questions whether or not vitamin E supplements are really correlated with increased risk. Who knows? It's actually life-saving. So you know where you found me? You found me at Costco lined up with the biggest bottle of vitamin C you've ever seen, vitamin E you've seen in your life. So big. I still, I'm still working on it four years later. Now, whenever you read these studies or any study from coffee, dark chocolate, alcohol, how do researchers do that? They take a data set where people have filled out food frequency questionnaires for many, many years, and they follow those people out in the future, and they know if they're alive or dead. And so they can ask, is nutritional exposure associated with being alive or dead? And they make a model. They typically make a regression model. And this model is the Y outcome, the thing you're predicting is, are they alive or dead? And the first variable you put in your model to explain it is the exposure you care about, vitamin E or vitamin D or dark chocolate or tea or coffee. And it turns out some questions 
we're just so interested in dark chocolate and berries. Everyone wants to know about berries, this berry, that berry. You know what nobody wants to know about? Pitted fruit, peaches, plums, you can go to hell, peaches or plums. I never read an article about whether or not plums are good for you, but I read about berries over, each week is another berry article in the New York Times. And then you know the pandemic is easing up when the berry articles come back up, you know? I'm like, oh, thank God there's some berry articles. Phew, things are going better. But you can't just look at the exposure because who takes vitamin E? I bet not a single person in this room, you all look like young people. You're not a vitamin E demographic. It's the older demographic. So if I just look at vitamin E and mortality, it's not gonna look so good because not a lot of 20 year olds take vitamin E, but a lot of 80 year olds do. So we gotta adjust for age, put that in our model, adjust for age. And then maybe you want to adjust for sex and maybe you should adjust for race. I mean, this is a common model. And so I'll be at, you know, not me, but people who work for me will run this analysis. And if it's interesting, they'll come tell me about it, you know, right here at UCSF. My friends in Toronto, interested in the exact same question, but he is conscious of something that we don't care about in the United States and that's socioeconomic status. So he adds that in his model. We've forgotten about it apparently in this country. And my friend in North Carolina, she walks out of the hospital every day and she sees the smoking corner and she remembers to put smoking in her model. And I don't see much smoking here. Well, at least not a lot of tobacco smoking in San Francisco. So I don't put it in my model. And my friend at Harvard, you know, he got to Harvard for a reason. And so he puts all this in his model, BMI, hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, alcohol consumption, education, family history, heart disease, heart disease, and cancer, blah, 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 blah. So my point here is that many investigators have access to the data and we're all probing these relationships and alcohol and coffee are probably getting 10 to the power of five different people probing it each year. Whereas cauliflower, 10 to the power of three, maybe not so interesting. Cruciferous vegetables, get the hell out of here. Each of us is adjusting for covariates that make sense to us. Each of those analytical plans will be a published paper if the result is provocative. Each of us makes sense to us and there is no right answer. There's no canonical right answer what we should adjust for. What if you simulated not just me or Toronto or North Carolina or Harvard, but every single person doing this work? And that's what Chirag Patel and John Ioannidis did at Stanford. They set up the computer to take one outcome, only mortality and substitute the 13 most common variables we adjust for all 13 or every possible combination up to 13, which is two to the power of 13. They run three 8,000 New York Times columns overnight and they get these clouds of answers. And these are their answers. It's a heat map. Each dot is a New York Times study. Each dot could be, you could talk about the New York Times. The heat of the map is over one hazard ratio. What hazard ratio is the heat of the map over for blueberries, beta carotene, carrots, coffee, the hot spot where most analytical plans give you this. What do you think? What's the truth about blueberries and dark chocolate and beef and milk and coffee? What's the association? Yeah. Yes, one or zero. one is the null. Yeah, no association. Most of what we eat or drink actually doesn't matter. Turns out we're actually remarkably tolerant, I think, to different nutritional exposures. So actually it's tough, tough for the nutrition crowd, but you can find extreme answers where one is and I didn't explain, but the axes are hazard ratios on one axis and significance is on the other, but it's actually not the p-value, it's negative log 10 p-value, it's done for transformation reasons. But it shows you that this is it saves your life and this is it kills you. And the heat of the map is it don't do nothing at all. And so why does nutritional epidemiology always flip-flop? Why, why will those studies always flip-flop? Why will we get, I would say, every single pandemic question that people care about from masking to lockdowns to business closure to school closure, you will get studies on both sides. Why? When many investigators have access to data sets, when there is no pre-specified analytic plans that we all agree upon, you can probe it and probe it and probe it until you get whatever relationship you want. If you give me any question you want and give me enough time, I'll give you whatever answer you want. And that's the problem. And that's why if you take a dart and you throw it in a cookbook and then you look it up on PubMed, these are random ingredients from a cookbook and they either increase or decrease cancer risk because we're in a career where we are incentivized to come up with a discovery. No one made a career on a hazard ratio of one. You make it on 0.75 or 1.25. And I'll be damned if you scoop me on 1.25. So I'm gonna go hit the stata and run it, run it, run it, run it. And the advent of computer technology has made it worse. We can run a, a popular question a million times. So if you want truth, you might have to look somewhere else. All right, so I'm gonna stop there. Thank you all. For coming. I'm happy to take questions, but you all have to go and, and, and dig things out of the brain. So I understand. Thank you. <laughs>